great day to be here. We are always excited to join together and to sing the praises of our Lord and Savior Christ. I want to welcome you if you're a guest with us this morning. Also want to remind all of us that, you know, we do have an option where you can join us via live stream. If for whatever reason you're not able to be here one Sunday morning or, or ill, can't go to another uh, Bible teaching church, you can join us. Uh, go to our website and then you can learn how to watch the entire service via live stream. 
And we also have the ability now, if you go to our website, you can find, uh, find previous services and watch those as well. It's a great ministry. It's a great way for people that can't be here to join us and worship with us that way. In fact, last week we had a room set up upstairs. We didn't really need the overflow, but we did have a couple that for uh, another reason, uh, they, they decided to use that, um, that room, um, and it worked very well. So praise God that we, we have that as an available ministry to offer. Well, I do want to welcome you uh, here again. It is uh, a beautiful day outside. We have so much to be thankful for, as we've already heard this morning most of all for the cross and what Christ has done for us there, making a way for the forgiveness of our sins. But we, uh, we are so blessed as a people, blessed as a church, and I know you'll want to take time to uh, thank God with me for that. Father, thank you. Thank you for this morning. Thank you for bringing us here. Lord, we do thank you for the blessings that you've given us in Christ, the blessings that you've given us as a nation and as a, as a people here today at First Baptist Church of Weddington. Lord, we know with those great privileges and blessings, there's great responsibility, and Lord, we want to be pleasing to you in every way in our lives. Starting right now, today, we ask that this focused time of worship would be sweet to you. We pray, Lord, that you would draw us closer to you through all that takes place this morning. Father, we pray that the gospel would be proclaimed clearly. We pray, Lord, that if uh, someone is listening today, is here today perhaps even, and has never received Christ as their Savior, that they would do that, that your Spirit would move and bring that new birth as only He can. Father, we ask for those of us that know you, that today we would be strengthened. Father, we would be challenged. Lord, that we would leave this place a changed people. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, well, good morning. Right. I always like saying that because you want to hear, you know. Anyway, well, uh, as you can tell, I'm not Pastor Edgar, um, but uh, he is and family are uh, on a very well-deserved uh, break, and so uh, I'll be doing my very best to, to lead the music today. If you guys will turn to the insert um, in your bulletin, uh, it is Blessed Be Your Name. We've sung this a number of times. Um, if you guys would like to uh, sing that, we're going to sing that now. If you all stand, please.
This is Sam Roach, pastor at First Baptist Church of Weddington. I'm glad you've checked in for the live stream of our service, but if you live in the South Charlotte area, I want to invite you to join us here next Sunday morning. We're located at 348 Providence Road South in Weddington. Our Sunday school or Bible fellowship classes for all ages meet at 945 with our worship service to follow at 11. I look forward to seeing you next Sunday. God bless.
this phrase and will help us each one to live in the reality of that every day and not have fear for the future because we know you do hold the future. And we thank you for this beautiful day that we have to come here to worship you this morning. And we just pray that you would be with us, be with our pastor, and speak through him to us and that we might just through your spirit, hear your word, and leave here to do your word. Thank you for the material blessings you've given us, and we pray as we give back uh, a portion of it this morning that it would be used to further your kingdom uh, in this community. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
scripture reading this morning is taken from 1 Kings chapter 5, verse 1 through chapter 6, verse 1. It reads as follows. Now Hiram, king of Tyre, sent his servants to Solomon when he heard they had anointed him king in place of his father. For Hiram always loved David. And Solomon sent word to Hiram, Do you know that David, my father, could not build a house for the name of the Lord, his God, because of the warfare with which his enemies surrounded him? until the Lord put them under the soles of his feet. But now the Lord my God has given me rest on every side. There is neither adversary nor misfortune. And so I intend to build a house for the name of the Lord my God. As the Lord said to David my father, your son whom I will set in your, on your throne in your place shall build the house for my name. Now therefore command that cedars of Lebanon be cut for me and my servants will join your servants and I will pay you for your servants such wages as you set. For you know that there is no one among us who knows how to cut timber like the Sidonians. As soon as Hiram heard the words of Solomon, he rejoiced greatly and said, Blessed be the Lord this day, who has given to David a wise son to be over his great people. And Hiram sent to Solomon, saying, I have heard the message that you have sent to me. I am ready to do all that you desire in the matter of cedar and cypress timber. My servants shall bring it to the sea from Lebanon, and I will make it into rafts to go by sea to the place you direct. And I will have them broken up there, and you shall receive it, and you, sh and you shall meet my wishes by providing food for my household. So Hiram supplied Solomon with all the timber of cedar and cypress that he desired, while Solomon gave Hiram 20,000 pours of wheat as food for his household and 20,000 pours of beaten oil. Solomon gave this to Hiram year by year, and the Lord gave Solomon wisdom as he promised him, and there was peace between Hiram and Solomon, and the two of them made a treaty. King Solomon drafted forced labor out of all Israel, and the draft numbered 30,000 men, and he sent them to Lebanon, 10,000 a month in ships. They would be a month in Lebanon and two months at home. Adoniram was in charge of the draft. Solomon also had 70,000 burden bearers and 80,000 stone cutters in the hill country, besides Solomon's 3,300 chief officers who were over the work, who had charge of the people who carried on the work. At the king's command, they quarried out great costly stones in order to lay the foundation of the house with dressed stones. So Solomon's builders and Hiram's builders and the men of Gebal did, did the cutting and prepared the timber and the stone to build the house. In the 480th year after the people of Israel came out of the land of Egypt, in the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel, in the month of Ziv, which is the second month, he began to build the house of the Lord. Um, after Jesus was crucified and um, rose, he appeared to the, to the uh, disciples and he told them to go and wait for the Holy Spirit to descend upon them. And so that is the, um, the preface behind this song that we still today wait for the Holy Spirit. Where my heart becomes free 
and my shame is undone. Your presence, Lord. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory. Thank you, Amy. That's awesome. We, uh, we have a great God. Amen? Amen. Well, before we, we uh, move into the sermon, I, I just want to share with you kind of my plan as we go forward for the, the preaching series. We, um, here's what I propose to do. Next week in the bulletin, and probably in the bulletin for the rest of the month of April, I'm going to set forth my uh, scripture passage that I'll be preaching from on Sunday mornings in the bulletin. Come May, in our monthly newsletter, The Illuminator, then I will put in the month of May's scripture passages. And so I, I hope to accomplish a couple of things by doing that. First of all, as we go through, and, and my plan is to get through First and Second Kings by the end of May. 
So as you can tell, there's a lot of Scripture. As we go through some of these narrative portions of Scripture, we're going to read from the passage, but we may not be able to cover every single verse. And so I want us all to be able, not just the pastor, but all of us, to be able to read the Scripture text for that week so we have it, we know it, but then also just, I think that's a way for the Lord to kind of bring us together in unity to let Him speak to us as we come together on Sunday, then we're ready for, for the sermon in, in, a, in a better way. So, so that's the plan. And then after May, my hope is that we will this summer finish the Gospel of John. We started it earlier this year, and I hope to finish it in the summer, but that's always uh, open to change as God's Spirit lead, leads, but I believe that's, that's where we're going to go next. All right. I'll take questions now. No, I'm not going to take... All right, let's, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for this opportunity again to open up your word. Lord, we give you praise and grace. We do ask, we know that you are omnipresent, but we ask that in a special way you would be present uh, continually as we meet as your people, as you promised to do. We, we thank you for that, and we we ask for it. We, we seek that. We want to know you better, and we want to experience you more and more. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, in, in 2015, a Hungarian composer named Georgi Kurtog, he made really a startling confession. He said that he, he really struggled with how to reconcile his atheism with the beauty of Bach's music. Here, here's what he said. He said, consciously, I am an atheist, certainly. But when I, when I look at Bach, I cannot be an atheist. He said that uh, when, he, when he looks at Bach, he has to accept, he says, I have to accept what he believes. Every time I listen to his music, his music is always praying. What, what about beauty. What does the Bible say about what is beautiful? Well, in our passage today, we look at what the Bible has to say about beauty in the context of worship, and we learn that God sees beauty in our worship when we live out the gospel. And we're going to see that in three main ways. First of all, we worship Christ who carefully builds his beautiful church. Second, Worship requires both redemption and righteousness, both redemption and righteousness. And third, when we fail in our worship, we can find forgiveness. We can find forgiveness when we fail in our worship. All right. So what's going on in this passage? It's it's really divided pretty neatly in terms of um, chapter 5 is preparation for the building of the temple, Uh, chapter 6 and 7 it records Solomon's building of the temple in his palace and some other buildings as well. And then chapter 8 is the dedication of the temple. And I'm going to somewhat follow that outline with, with these three points. But number one, we worship Christ who carefully builds his beautiful church. Let's, let's read. We read chapter 5 and verse 1, but let's go ahead and read together verses 2 through 4. The house, talking about the temple, the house that King Solomon built for the Lord was 60 cubits long, 20 cubits wide, and 30 cubits high. The vestibule in front of the nave of the house was 20 cubits long, equal to the width of the house, and 10 cubits deep in front of the house. And he made for the house windows and recessed frames. Okay, so by all estimations, as we go through these chapters, uh, 6, 7, and 8, we're going to see uh, Solomon taking great care, and he's building a temple for God. And by, by any estimation, really by all standards, it's a beautiful site. It's, it's a beautiful temple. And we're going to see two things under this first point that Christ carefully builds his beautiful church. The first is this. The human quest for beauty is good. The human quest for beauty is good. In chapter 5, Solomon recounts uh, what we learned earlier, actually in 2 Samuel, that his father David wanted to build a, a house for God, a temple for God. And God said, no, you're not going to do that. You, you've shed much blood, but yet your son, who I'm going to set on your throne after you, he's going to build the temple. Now, this was all said by God to David in the context of what's known as the Davidic covenant. 
It, it's a covenant, a promise that God made to David that David would, uh, that God would build David a house that lasts forever. It would endure forever. And that he would never, David would never cease to have a son to sit on God's throne, this, this throne of, of kingship. There would always be a Davidic king. And, and yet there's also this condition, as long as, as your sons, as long as they obey me, they obey the covenant. It pointed back to the Deuteronomic covenant God had made with his people Israel. Now, what is the Davidic covenant? It's really an elaboration, though, if we want to talk about this agreement, this promise by God to David. It's an elaboration of promises that God had made to Abraham. Remember the, in Genesis, God had promised Abraham several things. He promised Abraham that uh, he was going to uh, bless Abraham, make him the father of many nations. There was a, a promise of, of land. There was the promised land that God made to Abraham. And there was this promise that, uh, that uh, God would be Abraham's God and Abraham and his descendants would be God's people. Now, we stand right there in terms of that promise because the seed of Abraham, God said, I'm going to give you this son, this, your seed, and by, by through him, all the nations of the earth, all the peoples of the earth will be blessed. Well, that seed, Galatians tells us, is Christ. <laughs> and so by receiving Christ as our Savior, we receive that promise of God being our God and we being God's people. Now, why was even any of this necessary? If we go all the way back to Genesis, when God created the world, it was perfect. There was no problem. There was, there was, there was no need of this promise to Abraham. Really, uh, the promise to Abraham is, is, is a promise to get back to the garden, to get back to where things are going to one day be perfect again. In Genesis, we read of how God created things, created things perfect in the Garden of Eden, and it was beautiful. It was beautiful. In fact, when it talks about in Genesis chapter 1, verse 31, God uh, said he'd created uh, the, the, all, all of this, and, this and, and it was very, very good. good. And when, and when Adam and Eve Adam looked, and Eve looked at, the, at the, fruit, the fruit, they saw, they saw it was good for food. But before they even saw that, before they even noticed that, they noticed that it was what? It was pleasing to the eye. So the Bible talks about beauty. In fact, the human quest for beauty is good. Solomon in chapter 5, he, he's making preparations for a beautiful temple. This isn't going to be just any ordinary structure. It's going to be beautiful as we read about all the things that are included in it. The Bible affirms this human quest that we have for beauty. God recognizes beauty. He created the world in, in, uh, in beauty. Psalm 96, 9 says this. Here's a command. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness, in the splendor of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. So worship involves an appreciation for beauty. But the second thing that I want us to see under this point is this. The desire for excellence is a noble or honorable thing. The desire for excellence is a noble or honorable thing. A little, a little bit later in this passage, we're going to read about, it'll say in the English Bible, another Hiram, but this isn't King Hiram. It's all, he's also known as Hiram. He was a master craftsman. And uh, it reminds us of Proverbs. Proverbs teaches us this. In, uh, in the book of Proverbs, it talks about that one who is skilled in his work. Proverbs twenty two twenty nine. 29. If you want a scripture reference, you can look this up later. Here's what the Bible says. And this may be Solomon writing this as well. Do you see a man skilled in his work? He will stand before kings. Do you see a man skilled in his work? The Bible says he will stand before kings. Kings. I think this teaches us something about, about beauty and the desire for excellence. When we think about what Solomon's doing, uh, we know the author of Kings is telling us a story. If we put all of this in context, we understand that things aren't going to work out very well for Solomon. He's going to make some bad choices, and the seeds of those choices, we'll talk about that, are actually planted uh, early on in his reign. The, the author of Kings, some think it was Jeremiah, is, is giving us a history of the kings of Israel and Judah, but it's, it's not just a basic history, it's a religious history. 
He's writing, it could be Jeremiah, he's writing at a time, it was probably shortly after the last time that King Nebuchadnezzar and his armies came in and, and sacked Jerusalem in the, in the early uh, 6th century. And the person that's writing Kings, we don't know for sure who it was, is writing probably from Jerusalem and he's writing to the exiles. Certainly the message is that, that when we turn from God's commands, when we sin, that God is going to judge that sin. But it doesn't stop there because there's another message in the book of Kings, and it's this, that, that even in the midst of our sin, we can look at God's promises and his plans and we can find hope for the present and for the future. And so put ourselves in the, in the context of the initial readers of the book of Kings, First and Second Kings, it was just one book when it was initially written, it wasn't divided First and Second, and we see that there's encouragement, we see that there's hope. But we worship Christ. The, the book actually and the, the temple and Solomon point towards something in the future, points towards Christ. We worship Christ who carefully builds his beautiful church. The, the New Testament talks about this in Ephesians chapter 2. It's talking about the church, and it describes the church as a building, and it says there in verse 22 that, that it grows together into a holy temple in the Lord. We are actually a, a temple where the Holy Spirit dwells that God is building, and he's d- doing it carefully, and he, he looks at us, and he says, I'm building a beautiful church. But second, worship requires redemption and righteousness. Worship requires redemption and righteousness. Let's, uh, let's move down in chapter 6. Let's read verses 11 through 14 together. So there, Solomon's building the temple, and, and we're reading about that. And then in the midst of, of describing Solomon's construction of the temple, look at verse 11. Now the word of the Lord came to Solomon concerning Now, the word of the Lord came to Solomon. Here's here's God. Concerning this house that you are building, if you will walk in my statutes and obey my rules and keep all my commandments and walk in them, then I will establish my word with you, which I spoke to David, your father, and I will dwell among the children of Israel and will not forsake my people Israel. So Solomon built the house and finished it. You notice something odd about about this? It's, It's in the middle of describing the construction of the temple, we hear from the Lord. And notice how he starts out in verse 12. Concerning this house you are building, and then he never says another word about the temple. It's almost as if he's saying, okay, go ahead, you can, you can build this temple. But, but let me tell you what's really important. Yeah, I'll accommodate your wishes and desires to, to build this temple for me, but as, as Stephen said in his sermon uh, in, in front of the religious leaders in, in the book of Acts, uh, that, that no temple, no building can contain the God of heaven and earth. God is saying, okay, yeah, yeah, go ahead, build it, that's fine, but what's important to him? What? Righteousness. Righteousness is what's important, that, that you obey me, that you walk in my ways, that you, you follow my statutes and obey my commands. It teaches us that redemption mandates righteous living. Ravi Zacharias says that if we, if we look at Scripture, there's, there's an order that always happens. First of all, there's redemption, and, and the Old Testament will go back and many times recount in the New Testament as well, that, that one major act of God redeeming his people from Egypt. He brought them out of Egypt. He redeemed his people, but, but then he has the, the law that he gives through Moses. And then that's the requirement of righteousness. And then when there's righteousness, that's when worship takes place. Now, now don't hear what I'm not saying. We are saved by grace. We're not saved by what we do. Uh, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 speaks of this. It's by grace you have been saved through faith. It's not of works. We can't be religious enough. We can't be good enough. We can't, we, there, there's just no way we can work our way to God. It's by Christ going in our place on the cross. It's by his shed blood, his, his being a substitute, paying that penalty that we deserve to pay, but that only his righteous life and blood could pay for us. 
But once we're saved, you, got, you, got, you can't forget Ephesians 2, chapter 10. We were created, what? To perform good works. If we're truly saved, the Bible teaches, if we're truly saved, if we're, if we're in a relationship with Christ, then our life will reflect it through righteous living. So our redemption mandates righteous living, verses 11 through 38 of chapter 6. But second, our lives should reflect a concern for others. Our lives should reflect a concern for others. Let's look at chapter 7, uh, reading the first seven verses. Solomon was building his own house 13 years, and he finished his entire house. He built the house of the forest of Lebanon. Its length was 100 cubits, and its breadth 50 cubits, and its height 30 cubits. And it was built on four rows of cedar pillars with cedar beams on the pillars. And it was covered with cedar above the chambers that were on the 45 pillars, 15 in each row. There were window frames in three rows and window opposite window in three tiers. All the doorways and windows had square frames and window was opposite window in three tiers. And he made the hall of pillars. Its length was 50 cubits and its breadth 30 cubits. There was a porch in front with pillars and a canopy in front of them. And he made the hall of the throne where he was to pronounce judgment, even the hall of judgment. It was finished with cedar from floor to raptors. Worship requires redemption and righteousness. Our redemption mandates righteous living, but our lives should reflect a concern for others. Look at what verse seven says. It talks about this hall of throne where, where Solomon was to pronounce judgment. What's the only time that we hear of Solomon pronouncing judgment? It's in chapter three. And there, there are the two prostitutes that come, and Solomon uh, gives this wise verdict. But after that, we never hear of Solomon pronouncing judgment again. We never hear of people coming to Solomon and him acting as the righteous king, the righteous judge. Why is that? Why is that? Well, could it be that Solomon, as he's, verse 1, building his own house, that he's become concerned with some other things? That, that a, a for wealth and trading have now taken the place of him being that judge, that king that's concerned about every person in the kingdom. The ones that are forgotten, the ones that are, are in need of protection. It seems that that's what's happening here. Uh, we're commanded to help the needy and defenseless. Proverbs 31, it says, open your mouth, verses 8 and 9, open your mouth for the mute for the rights of all who are destitute. Open your mouth, judge righteously, defend the rights of the poor and needy. I always cringe when I hear that word social justice. <laughs> social justice, many times to me, uh, is something, it's kind of a, a code word for another government program. And, and, and so I just want to say, I, I won't get into all of this. I won't get into politics. Uh, every, every person that, uh, whether you're Republican, Democrat, any party in between, you are welcome here. You are welcome to be a part of this church family. We do not discriminate. Well, maybe there is some party we could find that would be so radical we wouldn't. No. But in any event, we're always, though, to look at... at Politics does matter, though. We're, we're, to, we're to judge the policies based on the Word of God. And, and let me just, just as a broad aside comment say that I do believe that uh, the church has abdicated its role in many ways of helping those that need help. But even with the myriad, one could argue, even with the myriad of government programs that are out there, I'm here to tell you there are people in our society, they fall through the cracks there, there is not a government program for every need that is out there, and the church should be rushing in, not waiting to, to, to find that crack, but looking for those people that need help. And by the way, it's not always the physical need that is the greatest need. That's not. We know that. It's the spiritual need. And what I mean by saying it's not always the physical need, many times it's the relational need. It's the relational need that people are lacking. It's that role model. It's that mentor with the breakdown of the family. So many children don't have that, but it's not just limited to children. So we're called to help the needy and defenseless. But second, in verses 8 through 12, I want us to see this as a requirement. We're to focus on the blesser, not the blessing. You're saying, wait now, are you trying to, you trying to guilt us, pastor? No, unless it works. No, I'm not trying to guilt you. But we should focus on the blessor, not the blessing as a way forward. Verse 8, let's just read verse 8. 
His own house, where he was to dwell in the other court back of the hall, was of like workmanship. Solomon also made a house like this hall for Pharaoh's daughter, whom he had taken in marriage. Why is that there? Why, 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 this, why bring up Pharaoh's daughter? Could it be that the writer of Kings is telling us that, that even now, early on, when, when we're going to read about God coming down over the temple, it, many have described it as the height, the pinnacle, the apex of the Old Testament in terms of when things were really right after the fall. But even, but even now, now, there are seeds of destruction that are being sown by Solomon. He, the writer's talking about this foreign wife, this daughter of Pharaoh that Solomon married. And so we see that perhaps Solomon, with all of the wealth, with all of the blessing, he was, he was focusing on those things instead of the blessor. It, it reminds me of how sometimes I think as Christians we, we can... We can focus on the blessings, and, and, and I mean not even necessarily material blessings, but, but perhaps just being out in nature and seeing what God's created. We, we can talk about that beauty, and, and, and yet I wonder sometimes if, if we, we kind of get stuck there and forget that the God who made that beauty is what matters. And certainly as we, we look at our material prosperity and the things that God has given us, I think we need to... We need to be asking those questions that, are, that I don't think there are any easy answers for. Is, is there a certain amount of, of, of a lifestyle, a certain level of lifestyle that is sufficient? And then to go beyond that is not right? I, I, mean, I don't have any easy answers for that. Meaning, with what we've been given, do we attain to a certain level of material comfort in our lives and then, and then do more with that? I think at least we need to be aware of that and ask those questions and say, Lord, with all that you've given us, with all that you've blessed us with, what would you have us to do with it? So redemption mandates righteous living. Our lives should reflect a concern for others. But third, verses 13 through 51, God is worthy of worldwide worship. God is worthy of worldwide worship. So it starts there in verse 13, and King Solomon sent and brought Hiram or Hiram from Tyre, other places it's translated Hiram. This is not the king, but he's going to do all of this magnificent uh, work, craftsmanship that apparently the Israelites didn't have uh, the ability to do. There wasn't someone as talented as he was to do these things. But I want to point our attention to, uh, we don't have time to go into all of the furnishings, but in verse 23, notice what it says is, is part of this temple furnishing. Then he made the sea of cast metal. And then it describes it. So there's this picture of the sea in the temple. There was, there was a, a, a picture of it, a, a symbolic rendering of it in the tabernacle as well. The sea, many times in the Bible, uh, represents a, a threat. But, but oftentimes it represents humanity or the nations. And what, what's the message here? The message is this in part, that God intends not to be worshipped just in that temple in Jerusalem. No, no. He intends to be worshipped throughout the earth. His glory is to be seen by all peoples. He desires that all men and women, boys and girls, should worship Him. He's not to be limited to to worship by just the nation of Israel uh, or, or just the United States, but by all peoples. God intends and deserves and is worthy of worship. God is worthy of worldwide worship. John Piper says it this way, missions exist because worship doesn't. What is he saying? He's saying we go and we do missions because not everyone knows Christ. Not everyone is worshiping God. And so God intends for us to take the gospel to all peoples so that God may be worshiped by all of them. When we do that, uh, we will see God do great things. You know, we had a, a, a Wednesday night service where our mission team went, that went down to Honduras back in February, they came and they gave a report of their experiences there. And it, five or six people on the team, each one of them uh, shared something about how they saw God work during that trip. And, and each one of them was just a, a, an excellent uh, depiction 
of, of how God uh, works and does something beautiful in the, in the lives of people and through people. In fact, there was one example, uh, one of our ladies was talking talk. about going to this, this village. Uh, it wasn't the place where their mission project that they were working on this time was taking place, but perhaps another potential side. And she talked about uh, one of the ladies, one or more of the ladies that invited her into to her home. And uh, these ladies were so proud of what they had. They had a roof, but they had, one of them had dirt floors. You know, their restroom was, was outside in, in a separate house. And, and, and she said, she described these ladies, how their faces were just beaming, and they were so thankful for what they had. And I just, as I listened to this, and I, I watched the way it impacted each of these team members, and, and we visualized being there and seeing, this is beautiful. This, this is a beautiful thing. And, and so I think the prayer for us is, is, is to understand that God, uh, he, he appreciates beauty, he created things out of nothing. If you're an, if you're an unbeliever and, and, and you have seen things beautiful, let me just tell you that, uh, that God is the master creator. He is the only one. Whatever man has created that's beautiful, God can do it infinitely more. In fact, God is the, he's so creative, he's the only one that's created something out of nothing. Theologians call it creation ex nihilo. What about us as, as God's people? Francis Schaeffer said it this way, the Christian is the one whose imagination should fly beyond the stars. God has an appreciation for beauty. If you're a Christian, he wants you to use those creative gifts and talents that he has given you to worship him. I like what Piper uh, says about beauty. He says that, uh, that we should be using Thinking about the gospel beautifully. Of all things we should be doing, we should be thinking about how we can say the God, communicate the gospel in the most beautiful terms. So we worship Christ who carefully builds his beautiful church. Worship requires redemption and righteousness. But third and finally, when we fail in worship, we can find forgiveness. When we fail in worship, we can find forgiveness. Let's look at chapter 8 together. Verse 1, then Solomon assembled the elders of Israel and all the heads of the tribes, the leaders of the fathers' houses of the people of Israel before King Solomon in Jerusalem to bring up the ark of the covenant of the Lord out of the city of David, which is Zion. Then chapter 8 is going to go on. It's going to describe the dedication of the temple. And notice what's at the center of, of this temple. And there, there's the, the holy place and then that's only where certain people could go, the priests, and then the Holy of Holies, where only the high priests could go. And in the center of the Holy of Holies was what? Was the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord. And what's inside the Ark? It's the Ten Commandments that God had given to Moses to give to his people. It's teaching us that at the center of our worship uh, should be God's laws. That's what he cares about. In chapter 8, verse 9, Verses 1 through 11, we see that we can keep Christ and the gospel central. That's what we should do. Verse 9, let's read that together. Chapter 8, verse 9. There was nothing in the ark except the two tablets of stone that Moses put there at Horeb, where the Lord made a covenant with the people of Israel when they came out of the land of Egypt. And everything that we do as a church and everything that we do as God's people, keep we should Christ, keep Christ and the gospel, and the gospel central. central. That's what that's God, what God wants, wants. That's what's place here with the temple. But second, we have hope because of God's forgiveness and grace. We have hope because of God's forgiveness and grace. Look at Solomon's words in verses 22 through 66, we read of what Solomon is saying to the Lord. But look at verse 30. We'll just start there. And listen to the plea of your servant and of your people Israel. When they pray toward this place and listen in heaven, your dwelling place, and when you hear, forgive. And when you hear, forgive. You know, all of this, the temple building, Solomon, it points forward to Christ, the master builder. All of the, the covenants find their, their ultimate finality in the new covenant, in the New Testament. Christ speaks of it in the gospel of Matthew chapter 26, verse 28. This is, these are Christ's words. For this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. 
which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. At the center of the covenant that we have with God and Jesus Christ, the central part of it is the forgiveness of our sins. Are we going to fail in worship? Absolutely. There are going to be times when, when, when we just flat out know what to do and we don't do it, of course. But we know that when we fail in worship, we can find forgiveness. Solomon recounts it in this prayer. We should recount it in our lives as well. I close with this uh, thought about beauty. Several years ago, Alicia and I took what was really our honeymoon to, uh, to the nation of Italy. Uh, when we first got married back in 1996, we, we were right out of graduate school. We were poorer than Job's turkey. Uh, I was getting ready to study for the Florida bar exam. We didn't really have the time. We didn't have the money to take a, a really a designated full honeymoon. So we did this years later. Uh, so we went to Italy, and we were able to see an unimaginable beauty, really, off the Amalfi Coast, just absolutely gorgeous. But I, I must say the highlight of the trip for me was going to St. Peter's Cathedral and, and standing in the, in the Sistine Chapel. I'd heard about this ever since I, I was a little boy, just at the Christian school where I went during elementary school. We talk about Michelangelo and the Sistine Chapel and how he, he painted the ceiling and just all of the, the, just all these thoughts just rushed back to me as I was looking uh, at the beauty of what Michelangelo, you know, he, you know he, said, he said, the true work of art is but a reflection of the divine beauty. The true work of art is but a reflection of the divine beauty. Even when we look, e even though the creation is still groaning, waiting for its redemption, we, we can look out and see the beauty that God's created. And then we're reminded of 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9, where Paul writes, he says, No eye has seen, no ear has heard, nor heart has imagined what God has prepared for those that love him. There's coming a day when we're going to be in the presence of Christ and whatever beautiful things we see won't even compare at all to that experience. Remember, God sees beauty in our worship when we live out the gospel, when we do justice. We worship Christ who, who carefully builds his beautiful church. Worship requires redemption and righteousness. And when we fail in our worship, we can find forgiveness. Father, thank you. Thank you for giving us your word and teaching us how you have built a beautiful thing in your church. You desire beauty in our lives through righteous living. Lord, we ask that you would help us to, to defend those that are defenseless, to speak up for the cause of the needy. Lord, we ask that uh, you would cause us to be beautiful in your sight. Lord, help us to remember that in those times that we fail, in those times that we don't look to your holy standards, we know that there is forgiveness, that you will help us, you will cleanse us, you will send us off in the right direction again. We thank you for that hope and that promise in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this is a time in the service where you can respond to that offer of salvation. We always have this time, uh, but the invitation never ends. Um, you can find me after the service, find one of our deacons if you have questions about what you've heard this morning about, about the gospel. But if you've never received Christ as your Savior, if you've never asked for forgiveness, I'm going to ask you to do that right now. You can do it right where you're seated. And then when we have this song of invitation, maybe you've, you've received Christ this morning or, or previously, but you've never shared it with anyone, I'm going to ask you to come forward. I'm going to be down front. I just want to encourage you. I want to pray with you in that decision. We want, to, uh, we want to help you find a church home. If it's here, we rejoice in that, but there's no, there's no uh, call to be a Lone Ranger Christian. So we want to help you get plugged into a Bible-teaching, Christ-honoring church. Maybe you know you know you're a believer. You know you've been saved, but you're not a member of a Bible-teaching church. You feel like God is leading you here. We rejoice in that. And this would be the time for you to come and present yourself for membership. Maybe you've never been baptized as a Christian or you were, were baptized, yes, as, a, as an infant. You weren't baptized on the right side of salvation, or you've never been baptized at all. 
God is, is leading you to make that step of obedience. It's not about salvation, but it's about obedience. This would be the time for you to come you forward and let us know your desire, 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 desire to be baptized. Our uh, hymn of invitation is I Surrender All, 596. <laughs> Chase, Katie, Katie, Chandler. Yes, Chase and Katie Chandler. Uh, their, their beautiful daughter, Alexis, she is going to turn three, two, two this June. She's very, uh, very mature. <laughs> they are coming uh, by transfer a letter from uh, Sister uh, Southern Baptist Church. And so uh, we're going to uh, rejoice that God has led them here. And if you are encouraged by uh, their following God's leadership, please say amen. Amen. And we look forward to serving Christ with you together. We're going to uh, let you know about our uh, First Baptist Church Foundations class where you can learn more about the life of the church here. And uh, we're just so excited. Uh, they've been visiting. They've been a part of the life of the church in Sunday school. So uh, thank you for being obedient to the Lord. They're going to be out front. So I know you want to come by at the close of the service and say hello to them and encourage them in this decision as well. Brother Dell. Um, discipleship training classes will be continuing uh, tonight at 6 p.m. So if you uh, can join us for those. Uh, mom's, bi mom's, mom's Bible study. Be Anxious for Nothing, Finding Hope in a Hectic World is a new Bible study for moms of pre-elementary age children. Uh, it meets here on Wednesday nights at 645 in the toddler room. So if you're interested in attending that, please uh, join us for that. Uh, Women on Missions will be meeting on Tuesday, April 12th at 7 o'clock. Um, so, again, if you're interested in attending that, please plan on coming. Uh, the Diamond Set will be going to JARS on Wednesday, Wednesday April 13th. Uh, the the course 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 at 9.30 and last at yes. two hours. Um, and then uh, Save This Day, uh, Ruby on the Lawn joining us for a free night of snacks, film, and family on Friday, April 29th at 7.45. And we'll have more details to come on that. Um, thank you guys for being here today. And uh, if you will, uh, our closing uh, chorus comes uh, on hymn 757, soon and very soon. <laughs>